This is a video about properly divergent sequences. So let's let xn be a sequence of real numbers. So we'll say that xn tends to positive infinity. So we'll put the plus sign there to emphasize that it's positive infinity. And what we'll write is the limit of xn is equal to positive infinity. That's what we mean by tends to positive infinity. And uh, how do we say that in symbols? So for any real number alpha that you picked, there should exist some index capital N such that all the points later in your sequence have to be bigger than that particular number alpha. So in a picture, for any alpha that you drew, at some point, you're, at, in other words, at some index, you should be able to go far enough to the right so that your sequence is always above that alpha. Similarly, we'll say xn tends to negative infinity, and we'll write limit of xn is minus infinity if, for all real numbers beta, there should exist some index in your sequence such that once you get past that, then all the remaining points in your sequence should be lower than beta, should be less than beta. So in a picture, what I'm saying to you is for any number beta that you picked, there should be some index n such that once you get past that, in my picture to the right of that, that all the remaining points in your sequence should be lower than beta. So all those y values, all those y values xn are less than beta. And we'll say that a sequence is properly divergent if either one or two happen, where one or two is what I'm referring to in these two definitions here. Okay, so let's do an example. Just how do we use that definition? So how would we show formally that the limit of n squared should be positive infinity? So here's the proof. We'll let alpha be a real number. And what we'll do then is start using some tricks. So by the Archimedean property, I know that there exists some natural number that's larger than alpha. In other words, if you plotted alpha on a number line, whatever alpha is, you're guaranteed to be able to find a nice whole number larger than alpha. Well, in that case, alpha is also, if it's less than n, then alpha is also less than n squared. And so then for every single n, little n, that's larger than that n from the Archimedean property, what should we have? Well, we should have the square of that integer is also larger than alpha. And so what did we just show? We just showed that eventually all squares, all n squared is going to be uh, bigger than alpha. And so that would be the proof of that. So recall that a monotone sequence is convergent if and only if it's bounded. That's the monotone convergence theorem. And remember, monotone meant that it's increasing or that the sequence is just decreasing. And so what we'll say here is a monotone sequence is properly divergent if and only if it's unbounded. And so how would we prove that? So the forward direction, uh, if xn is properly divergent, well, what's that mean? It means either xn tends to positive infinity or xn tends to negative infinity. But in either case, what does that mean? That means that uh, for any real number that you pick, if either of these two things happen, there should exist some index such that once you get past that, or once you get to that index, the point in your sequence, its absolute value should be bigger than or equal to whatever that real number is. And so what does that say? Well, that says that I can always make sure there's a point in my sequence than larger, that's larger than any natural number or really any real number that you give me. And so in particular, that says that xn is unbounded. To go the other way, since this is an if and only if, this biconditional, what we'll do is we'll suppose, remember we're gonna suppose that it's monotone, and now we're gonna suppose that it's unbounded. And so there's two cases since it's monotone. Case one is that the sequence is increasing. Well, since xn's unbounded, what does that mean? How do you write that down? That means that given any real number, uh, alpha, you should be able to find some index n so that there's a point in your sequence that's larger than that alpha. Uh, so in particular then, what do we know though? Our sequence is increasing, right? And I've got one point that's larger than alpha, then so, so should all the points after that. All the xn's after x capital N should be larger than alpha as well. Cool, and that's exactly what I say to you here. So for all indices past that magical capital N, xn, x little n is larger than alpha. And so that means that uh, in that case, that's another way to say that the limit of xn is positive infinity. Case two is pretty similar. What if xn is decreasing? Remember, that's the other possibility when we assume that our sequence is monotone. So if it's decreasing, same idea. Well, what do I know? I'm also assuming that xn is unbounded. So similarly, what does that mean? Well, given any beta, any real number beta, we should be able to find uh, some index, some natural number capital N, such that that particular point in my sequence is less than beta. Now what we're going to do is we're going to realize that, wait a minute, my sequence is decreasing. So if x capital N is less than beta, so should all the points, um, all the points with indices larger than capital N should be less than beta as well. 
So since xn is decreasing for all little n larger than capital N, we should have those points in my sequence are also less than beta. And so what does that say? That's another way to say that the limit of xn is negative infinity. And so that finishes the proof of that result. Let me tell you about two other, there's two other theorems I want to tell you about for sequences, and they're both types of comparison theorems. We'll just call this one the comparison theorem. And so what do we have? Let's say that we have two sequences, and let's suppose that the xn is always smaller than the yn. Or what we could also get away with is that uh, eventually, eventually the yn's are bigger than the xn. So I really don't quite need this for all n and n here. I could just say eventually this inequality needs to be true. So what are the two things that we could say then? Remember, this is big, this is small. Uh, what can we say? Well, if the small one tends to infinity, if it blows up, then the yn's should do that too. And the other thing we can say is that uh, if the big ones tend to negative infinity, well, then the smaller ones should also. And I'll try to draw you some pictures to help clarify these. So how would we prove one? So how are we going to show that if the small one gets big, then the big one has to get big too? And in a picture, uh, here is my picture. So there I've drawn for you my points like 1 comma x1, 2 comma x2. And so the idea, right, what am I assuming? I'm assuming yn is always bigger than the xn's. So the yn's always have to be above these red dots somewhere. Well, if the red dots always get larger and larger, then the white dots have to get larger and larger too. That's the basic idea. So how would we show that? So what do we want to show again? We want to show that the limit of yn is positive infinity. So let alpha be a real number. Uh, what do I know? Well, I know that the xn's get gigantic, so that implies there exists some point, some natural number n, such that once I get past that, then the xn should be larger than that alpha that you drew, or that we picked. Uh, in that case, though, what do I know? Well, I have this inequality that relates the yn's to the xn's. So if xn's larger than alpha, well, then yn ought to be larger than alpha, too. And what does that show? If yn can always be made larger than any real number, that says that the limit of yn is positive infinity. Let's prove number two, and I got a picture of number two for you. So in number two, what are we assuming? If the yn's tend to negative infinity, so the blue, blue dots are going downward as I move to the right, then what should happen? Well, then the red, well, I haven't drawn any red, but the point then, if the xn's are always below the yn's, so if I was in my picture, I know that like one x1 has to be somewhere around here, right? It's always gotta be below that corresponding blue dot. Then the point is, the xn's need to go down as well. So that's what number two is trying to say. So how would we prove that? So let's let beta be a real number now. So what do we get to assume? Well, I'm gonna assume that the yn's go to negative infinity. So for that beta, uh, I should be able to go far enough out in the yn sequence so that once I get to the right of capital N here, then I can guarantee that every other yn is less than beta. And then now what we'll do is we'll use our inequality again. I know how xn relates to yn. So xn is less than yn, and so in particular, xn is also less than that beta for all of those, uh, really I should say here, for all n past capital N. So again, eventually the xn should be underneath beta as well, which is the same thing as saying that the limit of xn is negative infinity. So that is the comparison. I'll tell you about the limit comparison theorem for sequences. And again, we'll see a similar result for series later on. But what this says is if you've got two sequences, xn and yn, here I'm not assuming there's any like inequality relationship between the xn's and the yn's, like in the regular comparison theorem. But what I am gonna assume though is that uh, both of these sequences consist of positive real numbers. And the other kind of odd thing I'm gonna assume about these sequences is that there exists some real positive number L such that the limit of the ratio xn over yn is equal to L. Then, if all that's satisfied, what can we say about these sequences? Then we can say that if the xn's go to positive infinity, then the yn's have to go to positive infinity and vice versa. So xn goes to positive infinity if and only if yn tends to positive infinity. So what would the proof of this result look like? So what do we get to suppose? We're going to suppose that the limit of the ratio is this number L, this positive real number L. And so let's parse out what that means in terms of like the epsilon definition. Remember that says that for any positive number epsilon, I should be able to go far enough out in the sequence so that xn over yn is within epsilon of L. So if I wrote that down, uh, is within epsilon of L. And so a convenient epsilon, sorry, the trick is I'm gonna apply that definition when epsilon is equal to L over two. And you'll see why I do that in a moment. 
So again, all of this stuff here is really just me using the epsilon definition of what it means to say that this fraction converges to L with the epsilon equal to L over two. Now what we'll do is we'll do some college algebra. I'm gonna break this inequality apart. And if I you know, make this kind of a compound inequality where I'd have minus L over two on the right and L over two on the left, and then I would add this L to both sides in the middle. What you'd arrive at is Xn over Yn is between L over two and three L over two. Now the last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna just multiply everything by yn. And this is where it's important that I assume both of these sequences always consist of positive real numbers. So when I multiply by yn, I know for sure that none of these inequalities flip around. And so what does that look like then? That tells me that, well, L over two times yn is less than or equal to n, which is uh, less than or equal to three L over two times yn. And this is important, this string of inequalities here is so important that I'm gonna call it star. I'm gonna to refer to it in a moment. Now, what are we gonna assume? Well, the first thing we're gonna assume is maybe this. Assume that the limit of xn is positive infinity. Well, let's look at our inequality, or maybe let's use our limit laws, right? So if xn tends to positive infinity, well then uh, so should any multiple of xn. So in particular, so should two divided by three L times xn. That should go to positive infinity also. And so uh, why is that important for me? Well, that's kind of related to this inequality here, right? Where I've solved for yn in that case. So in particular, saying that xn is less than or equal to three L over two is the same thing as saying that, well, two over three L times xn is less than or equal to yn. And so why is that important for me? Well, now I'm gonna use the comparison theorem. I know that this sequence, as n tends to infinity, this sequence blows up, therefore, so should this larger sequence. So we're using the regular comparison theorem to help us prove this limit comparison theorem. So by the comparison theorem, the big sequence goes to positive infinity. Also, again, since we found something smaller that also tends to positive infinity. So what we need to do is we still have this if and only up to prove up here, right? And we just showed this direction. So now what we need to do is show this direction. So let's assume that the yn's tend to positive infinity. Well, uh, in that case, again, what it comes down to is using this star in a string of inequalities here to help me out. Well, same idea. If the yn's tend to positive infinity, then uh, so should any multiple of the yn's in particular. So should L over two times yn. And I see that that's gonna be useful for me because L over two times yn is less than or equal to n by my star inequality. And so uh, in that case, this tells me that L over two times YN is less than or equal to N by above. That's what star says. And in particular, well, if this goes to positive infinity, then so does this one. So in this case, XN is the big, the big sequence, if you want to call it that. So in particular, since the small one blows up, then the big one should as well. And that is the end of the limit comparison theorem.